Now we want to shift gears a little bit uh, away from isotropic hardening and talk about another type of hardening called kinematic hardening. And we, and in the kind of the introduction on uh, uh, yield functions, we talked a little bit about what this entailed. But let me remind you, uh, kind of using our our uh, uh, stress axis, if you will, that um, the feature of kinematic hardening is that the yield surface, instead of growing, like in the isotropic case, the yield surface simply shifts. So if we draw our, our stress axis, this would be just a straight line in one dimension. So there's stress. And let's say this is our zero. And then we have some initial yield point, sigma naught. And in compression, we have negative sigma naught then if we're pulling out at intention and we see the hardening behavior that we observe sort of in our, our um, representative stress strain curve that we've been talking about, then the, 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 uh, what looks to be the yield stress is going to increase so that we might achieve a stress that let's say sits at this location. And then we, if it was isotropic, we would call that the new yield surface. The yield surface has expanded. Um, in this case, what we want to say is that that location there shifted and it shifted by basically moving the center of the of the yield surface to to some new location sigma sub c which i'll just i just call the center of the yield surface it's also called the back stress but uh in, in the case of what this location uh here would look like it simply says that stress uh, sigma minus the back stress sigma c is going to remain equal to sigma naught right so that says it didn't grow it just shifted um, and then i'll i'll just formally define this for you this is the center of the yield surface and often this is called the back stress so then we ask the question what happens on the the uh, negative end and if we if we just shifted the yield surface then then it's going to shift by the same amount it's going to shift by uh, the back stress, and in that case, we can see that this quantity also looks like sigma minus sigma c equals sigma naught. So those uh, are the same equation, hopefully you see. And so that we can write the yield function as follows. As uh, Remember, we want the, the yield function to be zero uh, when yielding is occurring, so we'd say f uh, which is a function of, of sigma up here, is going to be equal to sigma minus the back stress sigma c minus sigma naught. So when that quantity uh, equals zero, then we, then we have yield. Okay, the other features of plasticity remain the same. So we could talk about the strain decomposition as the total strain increment d epsilon being the elastic strain increment d epsilon sub e plus the plastic strain increment d epsilon sub p. And similarly, our flow rule doesn't change. right? Our flow rule still says that the plastic strain increment d epsilon p would be equal to uh, e minus e tan, right? where e tan, remember, was the tangent modulus during yielding uh, over e times the total strain increment. So it's just a fraction of how much of the total strain increment goes in the plastic strain. And we said that operated for the case where F was equal to zero and the partial of F with respect to sigma, D sigma was greater than zero. And then it, the, this quantity of the plastic strain increment was zero otherwise. Okay, so now really what the, the, the problem that's presented by kinematic hardening is finding an expression for the evolution of the back stress uh, you know, as a function of, of plastic strain. So we can write that then as, let's say that in, instead of an expression for sigma y, we need an expression for the back stress sigma c. So what we want to do is make an observation. So let's really quickly just draw a the stress strain diagram for the load up uh, here. So we have our elastic load up, we have sigma naught where it yields, and then we have an increase uh, as we as we um, as we strain harden, okay. So remember that now the whole surface is being dragged. So the amount that it's dragged must be proportional simply to how fast it's moving here along, uh, according to the tangent modulus. 
and I'll remind you here, this is E, the initial slope. What we want to observe in this curve is that during yielding, the, the back stress must um, uh, shift exactly with the, the stress increase along uh, the yield curve here, so it's going to it's going to be governed by the tangent modulus. So we could say that the the stress increment d sigma uh, c, so how how much that shifts is going to be equal to e tan, the tangent modulus times d epsilon. Okay, and this is going to be a d epsilon that occurs during yielding. Okay, we can also use the strain decomposition to write. Right, just using Hooke's law, we could say that d uh, sigma c uh, must be then equal to e, the Young's modulus, times uh, d epsilon uh, minus d epsilon p. Right, that's just the, this quantity represents the elastic uh, strain increment. So we can equate these, so and solve for the the um, total strain increment quantity during during um, yielding. So if we equate them, we end up with E tan times D epsilon, remember that's just during yielding, is equal to E times D epsilon minus D epsilon P. And we can solve for D epsilon. We wind up with that D epsilon is equal to E over E minus E tan and times d epsilon p, and we can substitute back uh, into the uh, into the equation for the back stress, and write that d sigma c is going to be equal to e tan times this quantity that we just solved for. So now this is e over e minus e tan uh, times d epsilon p. We could further combine to write that's e tan times e divided by e minus e tan times d epsilon p. Okay? So in the event that, again, just like before, the tangent modulus was the same uh, with respect to e, uh, epsilon p, right? We could integrate both sides again and write that integral now from sigma, uh, this is d sigma c. D, sigma c begins at, at uh, zero, so it starts at zero, goes up to whatever sigma c looks like, uh, and that's going to be equal to then integrate the other side uh, if. Of course, uh, epsilon p begins at zero and goes up to epsilon p. And so this is for now uh, constant e tan. We can write that, uh, that sigma c uh, is equal to e tan times e divided by e minus e tan times epsilon p. So now what we've done through this is been able to, to define the yield function, right? So that function, I'll remind you, is equal to, it says the yield function f is the magnitude of sigma minus sigma c minus sigma naught, and we now know what the back stress is, right? This is e tan e over e minus e tan times epsilon P. Again, that's only if e tan is constant. Otherwise, we have to um, solve it incrementally. Okay. One thing I want to note here. So, if you remember what we did in the case of uh, the isotropic hardening law, we we tried to find ways to make either a positive strain increment or a positive plastic strain increment or a negative plastic strain increment both go. Um, towards a, a sort of positive increase in the yield stress. This doesn't work that way. So I want to be, be very clear on that. So note, unlike in the isotropic case, where we introduced an effective plastic strain to ignore the sign of the plastic strain, in the case of, of kinematic hardening, 
the sign of the plastic strain is important, right? It's important because uh, it actually dictates the direction that the yield surface is going to shift, okay? So those are kind of the fundamental differences between isotropic and kinematic hardening. 